Hello, and thanks for joining us for this online event about school leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic and how leaders can best navigate these crisis conditions. I'm Dr. Sandy Leeton Gray, Associate Professor of Education at the UCL Institute of Education, and I'm your chair this afternoon. Now, in terms of how we'll run the event, once I've introduced our speakers, I'll kick things off with a couple of questions. But we're here to respond to your questions, which you can share throughout using the YouTube chat facility or via Twitter using the hashtag IOE Coffee Breaks. So to the in introductions, as I've said, I'm Sandy Leeton Gray. My own expertise is in the sociology of education and spans education policy, teacher professionalism, curriculum and assessment, as well as artificial intelligence and biometrics in education. And with me today, I'm very pleased to introduce Chingu, Professor of Leadership in Education at the IOE and Director of our Centre for Educational Leadership. Ching's research interests include teacher resilience and effectiveness and school improvement and systemic change in relation to England as well as internationally. Now, among her many roles, Ching is a member of research advisory committees for both the Cabinet Office's National Leadership Centre and the UK Chartered College for Teaching. And I'd also like to introduce Roger Pope. As well as being visiting professor at the IOE, Roger is CEO of Education Southwest, an academy trust of 10 primary and secondary schools. Prior to that, Roger was principal of Kingsbridge Community College, which was among the first teaching and research schools and an early licensee for the delivery of national professional qualifications. He's also served as chair of the former National College for Teaching and Leadership. Roger continues as national leader for education, and he's currently working on school leadership projects in North Africa and Northern Europe. And in 2016, he was awarded a CBE for services to education. Now, I'd like to start with a couple of questions for both Ching and Roger. Um, Ching, we can imagine the intense pressure that school leaders have been under since March. You'll both be talking to school heads all the time. Has anything surprised you in what they've said about the impact of COVID on their work as leaders? Um, um, yes and no, Sally. Because um, I'm, I'm speaking as also a a school governor um, of um, in a city primary school in Nottingham, and also um, a trustee of a multi academy trust. Because um, over the last few months, it's not surprising to see um, there are, have been voices of deep frustrations and challenges that relating to all aspects of leading a school. Um, and I think what has really been added, we can see adding to is, is, the work, is the workload and also workload complexity to what school leaders um, have to do and manage on, the, on a daily basis. Um, and also thinking, speaking as a researcher, looking at the reports, like some of the work um, done by Professor Gemma Moss in the IOE looked into teachers' duty of care, I think we can see is is a very differentiated picture in the in the system, um, where the challenges are more intense are in those schools that serving social economically more de more deprived communities. I think what is then, as Gemma has also written in her report, has um, shown to us is this situation. COVID didn't cause this. Um, societal inequalities or the challenges for school leaders, but it certainly has really exposed more deeply and sharply some of the embedded structural inequalities um, in our society. And it also exposed very clearly schools and school leaders alone who can't fix many of the challenges and many issues. And what really surprised me to some extent, which I shouldn't be surprised, is really also heartwarming to see the hard work, the duty of care and the resilience um, 
professionalism that our teachers and school leaders have demonstrated, trying to keep children safe and trying to keep children learn. And I think just in, in, in summary, what I have seen that in schools where I have worked is the school leadership that harnesses the energy and expertise from the school community. And that holds great promise to enable teachers and pupils to keep safe and keep learning. Um, it's, it has been an emotionally, physically and intellectual challenging journey. And where things have worked and worked well are in those schools where you don't see the quick fixes, where you see sustained professional development and a strong school culture. I mean, you have to really admire the amount of, of, of sheer emotional and physical labour that's gone into the post-COVID um, school environment, really. And, 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 you know, it's just extraordinary the lengths that people have gone to. And um, what struck you, Roger, in particular about this period then and the impact on school leadership? Whoa, where to start? Where to start? Um... I think I, I think I'll, I'd like to just pick up a word that, that Ching used there when she talked about a differentiated uh, response and a differentiated picture. And she drew from that, particularly some of the what she referred to as the embedded societal issues, obviously, you know, disadvantaged children, disadvantaged communities. But I think we also need when we're talking about this to bear in mind the, the sheer range of different scenarios that there have been across the country, and also the way in which leaders have had to respond differently, if you like what we'll call lockdown one and, and the ongoing picture. So I think if we go back to that time back in, in March with the initial lockdown, then I think that that was a leadership response which it was all about uh, immediate command and control leadership. So there, there was a crisis, there is a problem that had to be solved. And so leaders went into that mode of, don't let's sit around and talk about this, don't let's have democratic leadership, let's just get on with it and, and solve the problem and work out how we are going to manage children continuing to learn when, when they're not in school. And I'm going to say something slightly controversial, but it could be that there are some school leaders who probably found that quite exciting. That, that was a kind of a dramatic moment in their leadership career that they had to, to respond to. I think what also characterised that, that period was a very strong sense of cohesiveness between local communities and schools. And there were many stories uh, and some research evidence from, from surveys of feedback from parents, which was along the lines of, we never realized that teachers had to work so hard. We never realized that teaching a child was so difficult. We never realized how difficult it is to motivate a 14, 15 year old to do some learning um, when they're at home. And I think there was, generally speaking, a sense of, of mutual um, regard and respect for what parents and schools were doing and a kind of coming together. Now, since then, I think we've had a, a much more uh, divergent picture across the country. So I was talking to some school leaders last week uh, who are from the Northeast, who were talking about how some of their children have been out for three, four weeks since, since that initial lockdown. They were talking about uh, teachers within their schools who had been hospitalized and had then died from, from COVID. Um, so you've got those kinds of experiences down to other schools, say in the, the south of the country where I am, where they've only just started to have to send children home because of, of uh, the need for, for shielding, where they haven't experienced any um, deaths directly within the school community. So I think when we're talking about leadership in, in, in this situation, I think we just have to caveat our remarks against the vast range of experience that leaders have had in different contexts in different parts of the country. If I had to sum up the, the common feature 
across the country, it would be that leaders have had to retreat from retreat from strategic to operational mode. I think that you know we've got used to talking about heads, chief executives of, of trusts taking a more strategic view, standing back, planning for the future. Actually, these people have, have been in firmly operational mode and a very complex operational mode. We often think of operational leadership as being something simpler than, than strategic leadership. It's kind of something which is sort of slightly lower level. Um, what they've been having to do is they've been having to lead in a rapidly changing complex situation. Um, complex because the, the instructions, the lines of responsibility haven't been clear, uh, particularly this time round. They've been getting one message from Public Health England, another message from the local authority, another message from the, the Multi Academy Trust, another message from parents. Uh, they've not been able to get those answers quickly. They've had the unions peddling another kind of um, narrative around keeping staff safe, et cetera, changing scientific evidence in lockdown one. The, the narrative was very much children cannot uh, pass on COVID, let alone get it. And yet, lo and behold, in, the, in this iteration, we are seeing children who are testing positive, who, who are having symptoms. So really complex operational leadership. And I'll give you just one example. Um, a school in our, in our trust had to send home a bubble of 40 year 10 pupils last weekend. So 40 pupils had to isolate because of, of somebody in the bubble testing positive. On the Sunday, the head teacher of that school took 119 119 phone calls from parents relating to that issue. That's the level of opera, uh, operationalization. I'll stop there. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly very different uh, as, a, as a head teacher environment, isn't it? And very much um, thinking about the unknown and trying to anticipate the unknown in a way that uh, perhaps people weren't expecting to do. And certainly the uncertainty as well about transmission rates and how that impacts on different age groups and so on. Um, you know, there's con conflicting science on that. So we've had very good reports from the Pasteur Institute and the Karolinska Institute earlier on in the pandemic. Um, and it's perhaps time for another systematic review. Um, so people are really working in the dark. Um, can, I, can I ask Ching now, what examples of good leadership practice do you think have emerged that have helped schools weather these uncertainties at the moment? Andy, that's, I'm just thinking, Roger will probably be able to give more concrete questions, but um, answers to that. But uh, from my observation, certainly as a school governor, I did a curriculum review with one of our senior leaders. And what I took away from that conversation really kind of more or less reinforced what we have learned about why some schools are able to do well and to be able to do well despite the challenges. At the heart of that is the deep trust within the school culture that the senior leader was able to have the confidence that the head teacher and the CEO in the trust um, believe in what she's developing in terms of in very difficult and challenging circumstances to create and mature the new curriculum she has developed for the school. And also it's relentless focus on what really matters in these difficult situations when it's hard with all this managing the unexpected um, situations on a daily basis. It's also to keep focused about keeping children safe and keeping children learn and how we can achieve that. And it was quite interesting to also hear from um, from her talking about the importance of working as a team. She never felt she was alone. You know, all the, all the issues we talked about, I think the three words I took away from that meeting is collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Behind that, there is that professional trust. And, and focusing on the core business about how um, given, I think within the pandemic, she was trying to say to us, we need to, 
distinguish two fundamentally different issues. One is about trying to manage the technology and to teach children the way that we normally teach them in person. But a fundamentally different issue is about how to, in terms of pedagogy, managing and support children learn better, the online and blended learning. Those are fundamentally different issues. And as professionals and how we learn together, we just did a, um, a trust survey. And what I took away from the results is not that, you know, I'm seeing songs for the trust, but I think what really worked um, speaking to the school leaders is, is, is a value, is a shared um, values that we're here for the children. I mean, one thing um, one of the leaders said to me almost to put tears in my eyes. I was concerned about, of course, her, her workload developing a, a new curriculum given the challenges. And she just said, we have a strong team. And as a professional, it's part of my duty of care to, in, to ensure children are engaged in their learning. And I will stop here for. Roger, have you got anything to add? Is there anything that you've seen that, that really demonstrated best practice? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think um, I, I, I think there are uh, two two streams of, of of things that leaders are learning here, which which are almost in opposition to one another, or could be, um, and therefore I think that it will be very interesting as as we go forward to see how those tensions are worked out. So one strain is, is the kind of strain which Ching is referencing there in terms of that value center, centered leadership, uh, the, the realization from leaders you know, very early in this, that actually they needed to be highly empathetic in, in their leadership, highly affiliative. They needed to be listening very carefully to what parents, students, staff were saying to them. They needed to show through all of their communications that they were responding. And if you look at both national organizations like um, ASCL, for example, the, the, the leaders uh, organization, or you look at it at school level, or you look at it at, at the level of the multi-academy trust or the local authority, all of a sudden you get a multiplication of communication, weekly, daily newsletters, um, events, uh, Zoom events for staff, uh, in order to try and build that sense of collegiality, we're all in this together, we're listening to you, we're supporting you, we want to keep you safe, we want to keep you well, you know, all, all of that kind of strain of stuff. And then I think there's been another interesting uh, strain of, of leadership here, um, which is about, uh, about being more directive, and so in this situation, leaders have realized that things have had to happen quickly. If you want to put in place online learning, it has to happen quickly. In terms of keeping children safe, there are all sorts of new uh, uh, procedures and processes and policies that have had to be introduced into schools instantly. And so whereas uh, historically heads will often say they want to do something and it will take two or three years to align all the staff to that new policy, they've suddenly realized they've got to do this immediately. And there are some things as a leader that you have to say, actually, this is what we're doing. So on the one hand, you've got an increase in that kind of affiliative style. And on the other hand, you've got an increase in that command style. And it will be interesting to see how the interplay between those two things works out as, as we move forward. Do you think that that will have um, a, a sort of an impact on school leadership and school communities in a more long term sense then? I, I do. I, th I think that I think that one of the things which this situation has brought about is an impatience on, on the part of leaders uh, in that there, there, there hasn't been time um, uh, for all the kind of uh, I'm going to say slightly irrelevant chat that you get around all sorts of issues sometimes. And I think they've had to cut through and that say, no, you know, no, actually, we need to get this in place now. We, we can't we can't spend six months talking about the rights and wrongs of how best to do online learning. We, it's got to happen now, yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that we will see uh, an increase in that tendency to use standard operating procedures in schools perhaps compared with what we've seen 
historically. Um, and I think we will see, which we can say more about if we get onto this in a minute, I, I think we will see uh, a change in some of those middle tier structures in our system as a result of this as well. Do you think they'll disappear? Or the do middle you think, tier structures? Yeah, I mean, do you think the idea of leading from the middle is on the way out as a consequence? I'm, of I'm, I'm, think, I'm thinking more, I don't think it is in schools. Um, I think at a system level, no, I was thinking about that middle tier. Is it is it local authorities? Is it multi academy trusts? Is it is it regional schools commissioners? I think that it, as a result of what we have seen happening in the last six to nine months, I think we will see uh, changes and acceleration. Uh, and I can say more about that if if you'd like me to. I mean, I'm just wondering. Do you mean top down policy? You know, so, in a very so directed what, what, sense. No, I mean that what a uh, Ching Ching again, you know, talked about uh, collaborative approaches. What what we have learned over the last nine months is we have learned that however much a school might like to be seen as a uh, a self determining, self governing island, actually, at a time of crisis, no, you can only succeed through cooperation and collaboration with, with others, um, both because you need those collective solutions. And also because you need succor and support, you know, if, if you are going to fall, uh, go on a policy as a school to say, actually, we're not going to put children in bubbles, we're going to organise our learning a completely different way against what the government tell us, you've got to be really brave if you're going to do that on your own. But if there's a group of schools doing that, then, then you, you're much better off. And what we've seen across the country is we've seen a huge variation in the ability of local authorities to respond because many of them have no longer had the capacity, many of them have no longer got the relationships with, with their schools. Um, we've seen regional schools commissioners struggling to find a role, uh, and we've seen... The because very, this could have been their moment in the sun. It could. And, and the <laughs> ones who have had the moment in the sun have been very good multi-academy trusts. Okay. And, the, and the reason is because they have been able to combine that kind of collective strength and power and decision making with knowing their schools really well and having really strong bonds of trust with those schools. So I think that one of the, the leadership outcomes of this situation will be a good hard look by the government at that middle tier, not in schools, but, but nationally. You know, the government has been saying, you must do this, you must do that. Actually, that, that's not possible without some mediating middle tier between the government and the school. And, and we've seen it being worked out between local authorities, multi-academy trusts, regional schools commissioners. Uh, I think it's the multi-academy trusts who have emerged the strongest from, from this. And there's some big questions about local management of schools in the financial sense, of course, um, and the resource that's available and how differentially skewed that can be uh yeah yes i mean which was you know, supposedly being addressed through uh, addressed through the fair funding formula and the fair funding mechanism um so i think that we will see that being worked through but of course you know i'm, I'm beginning to sound like a proponent for multi-academy trusts here but what you see within a multi-academy trust is that ability to move those resources around within the trust uh, and, and address some of those inequalities that, that Ching mentioned. And what a lot of multi-academy trusts did in the first stages when the government was, was unsure as to what it was going to do with uh, providing free school meals for children during the Easter holidays, it was multi-academy trusts who drew on their reserves to do that up front. And a lot of them did the same with purchasing IT equipment for disadvantaged children as well. Um, and the government was kind of playing catch up but be behind that. Mm. Um, I mean, we really could talk about the policy angle of this for a very long time, but I'd, I'd like to switch to Ching now and ask a different question. Um, Ching, I'm just wondering um, what research has been conducted uh, that you know of on school leadership in the context of previous crises. And one example that springs to mind is Katrina in the US. And do you think we can apply empirical evidence from those kinds of studies to the current circumstance? Um, thank you, Sandy. I've looked into um, the whole body of research um, focused on leadership during crisis. 
and and there's a clear message i think is what roger addressed on um late uh, earlier is crisis actually creates both challenges as well as opportunities for leaders and i think what is also exposed is the importance of focusing on the basics of of course you know with all this crisis going on but you do go through different phases you know in for example if you look into the mckinsey report looking at some um, the different phases the school schools will have to respond and now we're going into the reimagining phase certainly in our trust you know also in some um other local authority focused meetings i attended you know school leaders thought we, we're now going into the next phase can we think about the future um you know the reimagining phase and so i would um i would say the practices may sound typical academics practices may alter because the context would always change but the principles are quite similar you know those issues we talked about relationships matter and also what's coming up from that body of research is the resilience and being optimistic as a school leaders you see the future but also you see how you fix you quick fix um, the the crisis but also at the heart of that is when we deal with un uncertainty um, and coming out of that quick fix is to think about the, you know, developing teachers and supporting school leaders. That's, that's kind of um, from the research is a repeated message that's, you know, how we continue really questioning profoundly the meaning of professionalism the kind of knowledge skills and attitudes that we we need to prepare our school leaders for the future and no one knows what the future is like and when we write about school leadership fundamentally it is about managing change it's about leading change and actually how to how to create the conditions and the cultures for sustained improvement. So I, I do agree with Roger, certainly in our multi-academy trust, now we see the communication is important, how you function on different platforms in different scenarios, in different spaces to keep the communication flow and shared values and shared vision and trust are the foundation for everything else to go on. Um, and, um, you know, I think those are the key messages, as I can see, coming out from the research um, in America, not only just a post Katrina, but also like the school shooting um, and how schools quickly react, respond and then um, moving to the future. Thank you. I mean, that is interesting to think about changes in professionalism. I and mean, we've had a question um, from Joseph Perkins, and he's wondering um, what the effect is of head teachers leading through their laptops. And he's asked, what's the, what is the potential effect of this on um, in, in using technology in a wider sense? What's been the impact on school leaders, particularly for, for non-teaching tasks? And I'm wondering if, if Roger can respond to that. Yeah, great, a, a great question. Um... I, I, I'm going to I'm going to that that word reimagine that that, that Ching used is crucial um, because that's how you stay positive and that's how you stay energized a bit beyond beyond this and I think that uh, the question there is really pertinent to that because schools are reimagining how they use technology for the learning of children. But we've also seen a massive change in the way in which schools and teachers have operated since since March using that. And it's actually been incredibly liberating. So if you think of most professional development, you know, pre pre COVID, it usually involved a meeting of some kind of, you know, anything from six to 600 people in, in a hall or going to a to a conference. Uh, and that means that somebody somewhere has had to agree to somebody going off on a, a course, having time out, paying the fee, paying the supply cover, all that kind of stuff. What we saw with the explosion of, of staff development opportunities on, on, uh, online is that, is that they were all, well, the vast majority of them were free and the vast majority of them were short 
and the vast majority of them you could watch recordings. And so we saw a real explosion of teachers accessing that professional development. And I think it was it was partly because they were um, they were at home and actually they they could. Uh, and I think there's also something interesting about the fact that they didn't have to go through a gatekeeper. They didn't have to go and ask permission or get funding to do this, this professional development. They could look at these menus of what was available and, and dip in, in and out. Um, we also saw uh, a vast explosion in, in, I mean, in our trust, for example, we used to have weekly meetings of heads. That was difficult for a lot of them to get to. They might have to travel half an hour to get there, half an hour back, it's a whole morning gone. You could have a quick meeting between eight and nine in the morning, wham, everybody's in there, everybody's communicating, um, and they end the week with a, with a kind of silly one, you know, the equivalent of after office drinks on a Friday to just kind of share experiences. So, you know, we know that teaching is a people profession. People aren't going to go wholly online, but I think they're going to be much smarter and, and much more um, efficient in the way in which they use it going forward. Really exciting, I think. So it, it, it sort of sounds like it's refreshing the parts that Teachers TV tried to reach and, and never yeah. quite managed to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, Ching, I'm just wondering... Um, you know, how do you think society is going to see this now in professional terms then? And the idea of, of holistic school uh, settings meeting the whole child and family needs and that kind of thing as an offshoot of professionalism. So that's a really great question, Sandy. Um, I think what I, um, there was some research surveys coming out um, just before the summer break. I think this, the society showed greater understanding about the challenges the teaching profession um, is facing or was facing um, in homeschooling. Um, lots of parents reporting that they understood better um, how to support and the, all the frustrations of not being able to support their children's learning. And being a parent myself, I certainly welcome the schools reopened again. Um, and I think it's, if anything, we, we also see, um, as Roger mentioned earlier, the great kind of, because of the understanding, I think, you know, you can see schools, communities working closely together. And that's the only way to actually, for, every, for, for anyone, everyone to survive this crisis. And we've seen, um, you know, just within our local community, how we work with schools now, um, doing the charity, work to support children in challenging circumstances to celebrate Christmas. I think, you know, those are great things and heartwarming things to see. Um, I, I think, you know, it's, I was taken away by a, a paper um, by Lindsay Anderson writing about leadership during crisis. I think the genuine questions, you know, for all of us to ask together is, you know, what do you need and how can I help? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting one, isn't it? But uh, we've had another question from a member of the public who's asked um, about uh, what your response is to the survey suggesting many heads may leave their roles sooner than they had planned because they're burning out from the COVID-19 episode, which is the flip side of that, if you like, the emotional work of accommodating the school community. I think it, it was, I would be interested in hearing what Roger says. But certainly as, as a researcher, I mean, when I was thinking, you know, Schumann wrote in 1984-87 about the nature of the profession, the teaching profession is filled with unavoidable uncertainties. And this is just another extreme example that school leaders have to deal with. And I think it also goes back to um, about what kind of schools are more likely to suffer and in what circumstances. And certainly in our trust, because of the, um, you know, the, the work we've done well before this, the, um, we were able to maneuver the expertise, the capacity to actually create the support that single schools are unable to, um, to, to manage given the quick turnaround time and the messiness and the complexity of the challenges. So I think, you know, as certainly as researchers, we need to ask more powerful questions about understanding 
not only the percentage, but where the percentage are more likely to be, what kind of situations, what are the challenges are, therefore how the system is able to support better. And the issues Roger mentioned about the mediating layer, you know, we can trace back to more than 10 years ago now, McKinsey in their report looking at education systems talked about the, the importance of the mediating layer. So you can, I would um, agree with him um, strongly what Roger talked about, you know, in these situations when if you are a single school, you don't have that support network, it would be extremely difficult um, to not only talking about expertise and capacity, but also um, the resources and the emotional support that school leaders also need. I liked what they, um, an AHT um, wrote in their latest reports about treating developing teachers and school leaders as a professional entitlement. I think this is what something that we, we, we learn from this crisis and looking at actually all those stuff we write about successful school leadership, it matters in this kind of crisis, collaboration, um, the trust, the relationships, the expertise and the capabilities of our, of our teachers and the networks schools have. So um, we've got about just a few minutes left now. So I'd just like you to ask you both um, one more question. So um, Roger, how do you think, um, I'd like to think about the past, present and future of, of educational research on school leadership. Um, we thought a little bit uh, about that at the edges, but specifically, how, how do you think it's evolved in recent years? And do you think the pandemic will have an influence on the types of research that we will see and that we should be doing? Um. Whoa, what a question. <laughs> um, I, I think in terms of, I, 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 th I think we, we, we have a system which is, which is undergoing change of more than one kind at the moment. So we, you know, we've got rapid change as a result of the pandemic, but we've also got, uh, you know, ironically, the pandemic introduced a whole new raft of initiatives from the government in terms of recruitment and retention of teachers, uh, things like the early career framework, reformed MPQs, reformed teaching schools. So I think it will, you know, there, there's a, a whole raft of stuff to, to look at in terms of how have schools reimagined in the light of the pandemic. But at the same time, we've got a whole raft of, of new uh, initiatives in education which I think are going to provide a lot of meat for for researchers to get their teeth into as, as well alongside of course the impact of the new curriculum reforms that are just coming through so I think it will be a really interesting research task if there is well a to see if there's improvement in in the quality of education for all children including the the, the, the disadvantage but then to try and unpick what were the factors which had the biggest impact I think will be a really interesting research challenge. And Ching, what do you want to be seeing? I presume you review as many research funding applications as I do, if not more. Uh, what are the ones that you want to see coming across your desk in the next little while? Good question, Sandy. I'd like to see more about uh, how we um, understand the profession better, think about uh, the meaning of the professionalism better, not just uh, the meaning, but also the enactment of professionalism in uh, across different contexts of schools. And here I don't just mean social economic deprivation, but also the capacity capability of of schools, different school cultures. That's what I would really like to see and also take well-being seriously. I think well-being is not just about teachers having extra hours, extra time. Fundamentally, well-being is also about teachers are able to and feel they are able to do their job well on a daily basis and to be able to achieve that. There are a whole range of factors really impacting on that. Um, so, you know, how, how we review the trust, how we review professional or autonomy um, and a whole range of things. I think, um, yeah. 
That's fantastic. Well, um, quick poll results before we finish. Uh, we asked the audience, has your experience of school leadership during the COVID crisis mainly been exhausting, energising, fulfilling or other? We have 50% exhausting, 25% energising, 0% fulfilling, oh dear, and 25% a mysterious other. Um, on that note, uh, we're very, very sadly, we're out of time. And so we'll need to leave it there. Um, I'd like to uh, thank you for all your comments and questions. Uh, thank you very much for sending those in. And a big thank you to our speakers, Chingu and Roger Pope. Stay safe, everybody. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.